Welcome and thank you all for joining Reps and Sertara for today's presentation. Are you prepared for June 24th? FDA promotional material submissions in ECTD format. Before I introduce our webinar goals and speakers, I would like to provide a quick overview of Sertara for those of you who may not know who we are. So who is Sertara? Sertara is the global leader in model-informed drug development. Our software and services span across clinical pharmacology consulting, biosimulation and discovery informatics software, market access solutions, and regulatory science solutions, which includes ECTD submission software and services. Our clients include 1,650 global biopharmaceutical companies, leading academic institutions, and key regulatory agencies across 61 countries. So without further ado, let me get right into our webinar goals for today. So our goal today is to provide you with the need to know information to assess if you're prepared to submit promotional materials in ECTD format. So this includes understanding current trends and advertising and promotional submissions to the FDA, recognizing the must have technical requirements for ECTD, avoiding common ECTD formatting errors when submitting your promotional materials and tips for success. And then just a quick note, with well, a disclaimer is this information, this webcast was prepared by Sertara and is based on Sertara's expertise and experience working with our clients on promotional material submissions. So Sertara is not representing or speaking on behalf of the US FDA. So now at this time, I would like to introduce you all to today's speakers uh, for the presentation. So first we have Rob Labriola, Senior Director of Regulatory Services, Rob has over 25 years of experience with regulatory submissions in the pharmaceutical industry. His areas of expertise include leading global regulatory submission projects, building regulatory operation teams, and implementing document management and electronic submission solutions. He has been involved in the production of electronic regulatory submissions to numerous health agencies at all roles and leadership levels. Rob provides regulatory operation strategy, consulting, and submission support to Sertara clients, delivering quality services that drive clients to achieve their goals. Our second speaker for today is Rachel Bombera, Senior Regulatory Operations Specialist. And she is a seasoned submission lead and publisher with a decade of experience in regulatory operations and helping clients achieve their submission goals. From small amendments to large scale original marketing applications, she has worked with clients on a variety of different submission types and ensured deliverables to health authorities that are timely, of a high quality, and past technical validation. Preparing promotional material submissions and ECTD and transmitting them via the FDA ESG is a service she regularly provides to clients. So to kick off today's topic, I'd like to welcome Rachel to begin the presentation. Uh, so when we're talking about advertising and promotional material submissions, uh, these submissions have lots of nicknames. I've heard of lots of different ways to refer to them as 2253 submissions, ad promo, advertising and marketing, but we're all talking about sending your promotional materials to the FDA uh, so they can be reviewed, whether it's the Office of Prescription Drug Promotion, OPDP for CDER, or the Advertising and Promotional Labeling Branch, APLB for CBER. And it's one of the most prevalent submission types. OPDP received 68,709 submissions last year. Uh, roughly a third of all the submissions they received. So this is not a few and far between submission type. It is a quite common submission type. Um, and that's why we're here today to talk about a uh, new requirement for these submissions. So a little background. Once upon a time, these types of submissions were done in paper. And when I say paper, I'm referring to those physical copies, whether they were actually printed out on paper or put onto a CD-ROM, a DVD, a flash drive, and all put into a delivery envelope that most likely was shipped overnight to FTA. They're not in EC format, which is electronic common technical document format. And this process could be a little bit of a hassle, getting everything together and getting it shipped off, but it was relatively straightforward. 
Now moving into the present, current times, as with everything else, these submissions are moving more towards ECTD and using the electronic submissions gateway to transmit them to the FDA so that they can go through an automated process and get directly uploaded to the FDA's servers. Uh, so this was started first um, as a pilot program back in June 2015 for doing promotional labeling submissions in ECTD. And this process is more complex. Uh, so there's special software required to do this in ECTD. And you have to know how to build and submit these uh, submissions to FDA so that they do pass validation, all the technical checks. Uh, and it really removes the manual process that FDA has to go through to process these submissions. So moving to the future, uh, but really the future is now since that final guidance mandating that these types of submissions be in ECT format was released in June 2019. And with that, there was a 24 month grace period for this to go into effect. So that deadline is June 24th uh, to submit these types of submissions. ECTD, this includes all your form 2253 submissions to OPDP and APLB, regardless of final samples or draft. Now I have to say there is an exception. Complaints about promotional materials would still be in paper or non-EC format, uh, but otherwise it's, it's time to move into doing all of these in ECTD. And this process of changing over from paper to EC can lot, have lots of impacts on your organization. So it could it impact your existing marketing applications, marketing operations, your regulatory teams, IT, say if they need to get new software in place, and, and lots of other things down the line. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Rob to speak a little more about that. Thanks, Rachel. Hi, everybody. As far as uh, impacts, what Rachel speaks about on this slide, this next slide, is this waterfall process flow chart, the main takeaway is know your stakeholders across the enterprise. It can, uh, more often than not, people in each of these areas is very, uh, are very focused on their particular piece. And they're either not aware of, or uh, they don't understand the total process and all the different linkages. So if you look at this flow chart, for example, marketing people may develop the content of the material and hand it off to somebody to review in regulatory or legal affairs. And they in turn hand it off to someone in regulatory operations. Rachel compared and contrasted the old days where all the person had to do was put it in a delivery and express envelope and ship it out by midnight that night. But uh, nowadays with electronic common technical document, the reg ops person needs to not only make sure it's properly prepared, put it in the proper place, publish it, validate it, and then electronically transmit it. So this is why it's important that you have discussions and identify all the handoffs and the possible disconnects across your organization. I recommend that you establish timelines and share uh, the timelines with all parties involved. To sum it up, I would uh, recommend that frequent and communicate, continuous communication is a recipe for success. Some of the basics, module one, and in a moment I'll get into a little bit more detail, is the home for all these promotion, advertising and promotional materials. Some of the very basics, an FDA, Form 2253 must be included with all submissions and make sure you have the all fields popular, populated correctly. We'll get into a little bit of that in more detail in just a moment. And finally, make sure you separate consumer from healthcare professional material. And again, submission types should be kept separately as well.
This is a snapshot of the FDA's ECTD table of contents. It's a snippet of the home for advertising and promotional material. As you look across this, whether it's a print ad or a website or a video, each item has a proper place in this ECTD taxonomy. And your regulatory operations people will make sure the files are named correctly and they're of the proper format and they go in the right spot before transmitting. As a side note, if you, uh, this is just a, a current copy of the table of contents from the FDA's website. If you do go out there, uh, you'll see also that it includes acceptable file formats for these types of submissions. And we'll have resources at the end of this presentation that guide you onto those resources. I'll let uh, Rachel talk about a few of the, the nuances between uh, CDER and CBER. Sure, so some of the nuances to keep in mind between the different agencies is for CBER, you're going to use the 2253 form for draft or final samples of promotional materials. And there's even a specific box on the form for CBER products where you'll be able to check which it is, draft or final. And when you go at the end to submit these, uh, this sequence by the ESG, there will be a submission type that says promotional material. So specific to this type of submission. Whereas with OPDP, you're only going to use the 2253 form for final samples of promotional materials. And when you go to submit via the ESG, the submission type will simply be ECTD, which if you're used to transmitting other types of EC submissions, you're fairly familiar with. I uh, also wanted to mention that we highly recommend you use version 3.3, the DTD specification. Uh, in the past, APLB piloted accepting uh, promotional submissions, the older version of the specification, but highly recommend if you haven't already moving to using the current specification uh, and as time moves forward, you know, use whatever updating current specification it is for uh, these types of submissions. So now talking a little more about the 2253 form. As with any FDA form, we highly recommend that you check you're using the current version uh, and that you read the instructions FDA provides. Uh, personally, I find these could be a little more helpful than you might expect at first. Uh, we highly recommend you're using the current version of every form. And Electronic signature should be used for this form. Uh, more and more submissions are moving electronic as how, how we're here today talking about promotional materials. Uh, your signature should move to being electronic as well. And some common errors for this form include missing information, incorrect dates, incorrect application numbers, uh, highly recommend that after you get this form together, you double check all the information is correct. Uh, FDA does use this form to process your submission. So it's very important that you make sure our information hasn't changed, that there's no typos uh, and that everything looks good on this. And then, Talking a little more about this form in relation to your submission. So when you build out the EC structure and enter the metadata for your promotional pieces, it's important to keep in mind that it should really match up with the information on your 2253 form. So for example, in box eight of the form, you'll be able to check whether it's a promotional or consumer material submission, and your EC structure should match that. 
also for each material that you're submitting, there is a preset list of material types. So for example, a website, or it might be a print ad. And this on your form should match what's in your submission. I also want to note in that dropdown, there is a possibility of selecting simply promotional labeling, but it's recommended that you only use this if the other uh, material types really don't fit your promotional piece. Uh, so the type that's simply promotional labeling should really not be used unless, say, the other descriptions don't fit. And when it comes to the high level metadata for your sequence, and the submission type is going to be promotional labeling advertising, and the submission subtype will most likely be original. There are other possibilities for the subtype, such as resubmission or amendment, but unless you're truly amending a material or resubmitting something at FDA's request, uh, the subtype original should be used. Now, common errors, uh, which of course we want to avoid when, when there's a submission that's error-free, can be processed automatically and get to a reviewer faster. So eliminate that manual processing. So common errors can include that the audience type doesn't match the form, items are in the incorrect section or missing or product labeling isn't submitted under 114.6 when it needs to be there to accompany your promotional materials. Or one I've seen uh, sponsors tend to tend toward is wanting to include a 356H with their submission. So it's so used to including that with their other types of submissions. But for this, for promotional materials, it's really not needed and shouldn't be added to the submission. And if there is errors with a sequence, most likely FDA will have to contact that sponsor and have them revise the submission and resubmit. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Rob to speak a little more. Continuing on with the uh, theme of tips with uh, regard to uh, correspondence, there's a proper area for correspondence related to promotional materials in 115.1. One thing, especially early on, we saw a lot of is people wanted to put a cover letter in section one two and that's not uh that's not appropriate another uh small nuance we've seen with regard to correspondence is opdp would prefer you address it to a generic person such as the opd project manager they're asking sponsors to avoid using specific person's names or titles or project managers to just give it the generic term dear opd project manager and then finally, especially early on, there were one or two folks that uh, had complaints regarding prescription drug promotion, and uh, that's not to be sent in the ECTD. In fact, um, the FDA's hitting the 10 year anniversary, something called the FDA Bad Ad Program. If you go out to their website and look about that, uh, you can find information on that where any individual can report uh, a bad advertisement directly to the FDA. Continuing on with a few more tips regarding advisory, or if you have a new drug that you're submitting for accelerated approval for a serious or life-threatening illness, if uh, in that case, uh, you have to submit all uh, material in advance during the promotional uh, review process. So any promotional labeling or advertisement that you intend for dissemination, you have to submit them uh, within the 120 days following marketing approval. And after 120 days, uh, 
of your marketing approval. You still have to submit all your promotional materials at least 30 days uh, prior to the intended uh, time of dissemination for review. So um, if you are submitting advisory comments, for example, um, there's a place in 115.1.4 for these uh, materials to be reviewed. This is a rather busy slide to look at. Uh, so the, the main thing I wanted to point out here is, is uh, sometimes uh, there are instance, instances where a company submits uh, comments and decides they no longer want to wait for the FDA for their comments back. And that's perfectly fine. And again, we've seen this a few times and it's for a variety of reasons. So if you do want to pursue that, your correspondence, uh, should inform ODP you no longer wish to wait for advisory comments and uh, that you will disseminate materials after the 30-day pre-submission period. If you follow that course of action, a separate uh, 2253 is required uh, prior to dissemination. It should be submitted in an ECTD sequence. Um, there are a few other suggestions on this slide. Again, it's rather busy. I won't uh, read through them in detail. You can go back and look at them later. Uh, moving on to the topic of group submissions. Um, we see a few group submissions from time to time. The intent of uh, group submissions was to bundle things and to uh, make uh, the process quicker and more economical and save time. People have varying experience with it. If you do use group submissions, um, they should be used, uh, they're commonly used for promotional material that uh, involves more than one product. And as far as the FDA form 2253 goes, um, as Rachel showed you the picture of the 2253, you should make sure you check the box for multiple products. And uh, namely, this spans one application type, so you should not try to group or blend over a BLA to an NDA, for example. And a few of the errors on the slide here are uh, the most common one we see is the regional file does not match what uh, is listed on the application between your, your cover letter and your form. Or uh, very common as well as package inserts that Rachel mentioned a while ago are accidentally uh, not included in the submission. As far as for some tips, and I'm just gonna speak about CEDAR, for example, is uh, if you need to establish a test account with the, uh, with the electronic gateway, um, you can email the CEDAR e sub team at this email here below and uh, request a test account. We always recommend that if this is your first time through, do a test account and send not just one, but send several pilots back and forth. Give yourself plenty of time to pilot and make sure you get it right. Um, so eSub will give you a test account and you can do this back and forth where you try different types of submissions and make sure you have it right before you go live. Um, to email the uh, OPD folks, this is the email listed here. Um, if you do have an issue ever, anytime with a particular submission, um, each submission is uh, issued what we call core ID, which is a unique system generated number that will allow the FDA to track down your particular submission and uh, look at it in, in detail. But at any rate, uh, if you do send a sample in, the, the FDA team will... Uh, look at it, give you feedback, and as mentioned, it'll give you time to fine tune your process. Similarly, uh, with APLB at CBER, if you go out and look on their website, they have uh, additional information on their process. So some suggestions to get started uh, by the germ theory of management. What I mean here is changing people's beliefs is not easy. The germ theory, I liken that to 100 years ago, 150 years ago, when scientists discovered there were germs and they were trying to convince people to wash their hands and uh, wash their surgical implements, sterilize their surgical implements. And people were like, well, geez, we can't see a germ. We don't really believe that it exists. So 
changing people's beliefs and the way they're used to doing things is not easy. So gather your whole team. If you go back and look at that waterfall slide we had on uh, a few slides back, I would suggest processing everything out in a flow chart. If you draw it out, um, look at your as is, how you do things today, map that out. And then once you have your as is down, look at what your to be needs to be. And you'll see that uh, electronics uh, ECTD for these types of submissions doesn't 100% mimic the old paper process. So make sure you uh, add in uh, all the key stakeholders and set, uh, set a timeline to accomplish this and get it to everybody. If you're already submitting ECTD, that's great. Before the uh, guideline goes into effect this June, I would suggest that you and your team go back and reread it and review it and make any fine tuning to your process. And with that, uh, I'll turn it back over to Rachel for a few final slides. So some final thoughts and recommendations uh, moving forward. There is an FDA webinar uh, titled OPDP Electronic Submissions, Common Errors to in ECD and How to Avoid Them. I uh, highly recommend listening to this. Um, uh, it gives a lot of useful tips and mentions things that FDA has seen so that you can avoid making the same errors uh, as some other folks. Also highly recommend, as Rob mentioned, submitting a promotional sample. Uh, submission to OPDP and getting that feedback. If you're, you want to get that feedback on your test submission to make sure that you're ready to go with your real submissions. You don't want that feedback on your real submissions. <laughs> um, and plan early. Uh, we're talking about June 24th for this being implemented, but that's only two months away, which in our world is really right around the corner. Uh, so if you're not already planning uh, to do this, we highly recommend that you do it right away. Don't wait until June 23rd to get started and figure out what you need to do. Uh, you know, Avoid any type of uh, errors uh, and get your planning in place now. Uh, so on that note, we want to reinforce, you do need to get your process in place and get your technology in place. Make sure you have that EC software or the ability to get that EC submission built. Send that sample EC submission off. And again, reinforce that the, the clock is running. Um, uh, it's time to prepare. Again, the date is June 24th. Um, so make sure you note that date down and just coincidentally, uh, that's my birthday, so I can't forget the date. Uh, so I hope you won't forget the date either. <laughs> and plan for success. And we hope you're all successful with these types of submissions. So with that, I'm gonna pass that back over to Danny. Okay, great. Let me just advance the slide. All right, so thank you, Rachel and Rob, for sharing your insights around promotional material submissions to the FDA. Before we get into your questions, two quick things I would like to share with you all. If you enjoyed this event, please join us for another RAPS webcast on May 6, entitled Plan to Accelerate Your Time to Submission. Um, attend this webinar to know when and how to plan for a marketing submission, how to identify key risks to submission timing, and finally, how to apply proven techniques for reducing and sticking to critical path timelines. And then just one more, one more slide before we get into your live questions. When it comes to your promotional material submissions in ECTD format, Sertara is here to help. Whether it's our global submit ECTD software, Synchrogenics team of experts in ECTD publishing, or a combination of the two, we are here to help simplify your promotional materials submissions. So now at this time, we will jump right into the Q&A. So we've gotten quite a, few, quite a few questions in. So 
I will start going through them and I'll throw this first question to you, Rachel. So when you are transmitting a submission via the FDA electronic submission gateway, is there a distinction between which submission type you should select depending on the center you are sending it to? Yeah, I think we talked a little bit about this. Um, with CDER, you're going to select the ECTD submission type, uh, which is used uh, pretty often and regularly for EC submissions. And But for CBER, there will be a specific promotional labeling type that you're going to use for transmitting. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Uh, and then, Rob, I'll throw this question to you. Uh, so the question came in, is it necessary to submit promotional material submissions sequentially with other types of submissions? You can, but uh, what we see and what uh, I think has become a best industry practice is to set aside uh, a block of numbers to use for these types of submissions. So for example, you could reserve the 5,000 series and start your same your first promotion submission off uh, 5,000 moving forward. That way you don't have to uh, de-conflict sequence numbers with other types of submissions and you have a nice home for where all this type of material will go. Okay, thank you for that. And then I'll just alternate between you two with the questions coming in. So Rachel, we have a question. Um, does the current uh, P PL, I think that might be product labeling, does that need to be submitted with promotional materials, even if it even if it has not been updated? Yes. Yeah, so for when you're submitting promotional materials, uh, that current product labeling needs to be in 114.6. Uh, so uh, even if it hasn't been updated, still needs to be submitted as new with that promotional material. So if it is already in the application, you can normally create a cross-reference to it, and, um, but it does need to be submitted. Okay. And then another question, I'll throw this to you, Rob. So if, if references need to be submitted for an annotated version of a promotional piece, where should they be placed in the submission? Uh, so if you go back uh, to the copy of the ECTD talk I showed you on the slide deck, you'll see there's a specific section in, uh, in 1.15 for annotated references. And if you go down that list, the, the specific spot is 1.15.2.1.4 for uh, that type of material. Okay. And then another question just came in. Um, so if, if the application ECTD version is not 3.3 yet, would you suggest using ECTD 4.0 or only upgrade to ECTD version 3.3 right now? Uh, so I would think 3.3. Um, Rob, did you have any perspective on this as well? Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that as well. In fact, the 4.0's not yet ready, hit the street ready for prime time. So that's uh, that's your best bet. In fact, I'll go a step further and share with you a story. We know of one company that uh, recently submitted uh, traditional advertising and promotional material to CBER and their paper submission a few weeks ago was rejected and returned back to them. And they said, please submit this VECTD. And we found that very interesting. I thought it was interesting because the cutoff date's not yet uh, June. But uh, the reason being is uh, this is a brand new product and it was their very first advertising and promotion submission. They probably wanted to get it started off on the right foot. So they recommended that they start with the 3.3. DTD and started ECTD from this month moving forward. Okay, great. And another question, uh, is it required to annotate your promotional materials? So I believe it's not, it's not required 
you can submit it and um, I mean, it can be helpful to submit. It's, it's not required. It could be requested as well. And again, it can be helpful, but no, not technically required. Okay. And I would just add on to that too. There's FDA is not going to get upset if you raise your hand and ask a question and there's no, I know we we've been working with this for quite some time and I'm, I, sometimes I feel like I'm still learning something new every day. So if you do have questions uh, at the last end of tail end of our slides, we have some references, ask, uh, ask them and they'll certainly, they're very anxious to give you feedback. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Another question, if the version of the labeling in 1.14.6 hasn't changed, can you link to a past sequence where it was submitted? Um, if I understand the correct, and I'll jump in and Rachel, please add on. If I understand right. the question correctly, you should submit that fresh every time is my understanding. Yeah, so we have created cross-reference leaves to make sure that that product labeling is included in 114.6 in the new submission. Uh, so, so that is possible, uh, but it, it does have to be in the sequence. Okay. And then another question, if you opt not to wait for advisory comments, what is the impact slash course of action? If FDA has comments, do you have to pull back promotional materials? Are you formally notified or does it come up during the adcom? I'll, uh, I know I had a slide where I spoke about this for a moment or two. Uh, I think it all depends is uh, generally though, if you do decide not to wait and again, I, as I mentioned, we've seen people elect this for various reasons. You should wait for the period to go by and be prepared to address whatever might come up. Okay. And then another question around regarding group submissions, same type, which product application should be used? Uh, so I, I guess it depends on your different applications, uh, what, what you think would be best uh, between them, uh, your main application. Um, Rob, do you have any recommendations on this? Um, I'd have to go back and look if there was one way over, one suggestion over the other. Again, uh, We've seen a few people dabble in group submissions, but by and large, uh, for for various reasons, most people choose not to group them. Um, where where we do see it is is where there's two programs that are so closely hooked together, it just makes sense. Um, so selecting the one main application to be the anchor for is usually what we see. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we have a question around a cover letters. So when is a cover letter required with OPDP submissions? So cover letter really be part of your correspondence submissions. So if you need to submit correspondence uh, regarding your promotional materials, that would go in 115. Um, Rob mentioned we have that list of different sections on that earlier slide. So you would still uh, be placing it within that module 115 section specific to these uh, types, uh, not in 1.2. And again, early on uh, a year or two ago or three ago when people started, to, that was a very common mistake putting something in 1.2. Another common error I think we mentioned also is, is early on people thought they had to also include a 356H for like an NDA, for example, you don't need to do that either. Okay. 
And then we're getting a lot of questions in regards to Sertara's Global Submit ECTD software. I would just direct anyone that's interested in the, the Global Submit ECTD software or Asynchrogenics services to visit the link on the screen for some more information. And then just for anyone specifically, you know, interested in the Global Submit ECTD software, I'll just put a URL to that web page directly in the chat so you all can access it from there. Uh, then moving back on, um, so a question around timelines. Um, so what is the timeline for FDA to review the promotional material? Um, I'll just start it out, uh, Rachel, please add on. Generally, it's, uh, I, I would say it, it all depends on the material, but generally within the span of, uh, of a 30-day of a window. Okay. And then a question around the deadline of June 24th. So with the deadline being June 24th of this year, Will it cause a potential bottleneck with submissions or responses from the FDA? Oh, I think Rob, you're on mute. I, I'm sorry, thank you. I'm sorry, that's a great question. I wanted to ask, uh, you did the straw poll. I don't think I saw the results go up. To help answer that question, is are we able to put them up again or? Sure. Yeah, Alex, if, if you not, could... uh, if not, I'll answer your question. I don't, I think there'll be a little bit of a bump in activity. Many people have already started to transition over to ECTD for this type of material. So um, our experience is the, the last decade, the FDA electronic submission gateway and the servers that receive things at, at FDR are incredible. They're, they're strong, they're powerful. Um, I think it'll just be a blip up on the screen. Yeah, we've already processed a lot of these types of submissions in ECTD. So uh, I, gu I guess we'll find out. We'll see on June 24th. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it looks like we have a, a follow-up question in regards to sequence numbers. Um, so the question is, what if we use SNs 9000 and up for safety submissions? What sequence series do you recommend we use for promotional submissions? So if you're using 9000s, um, I think depending on what other sequences you submitted, likely what makes the most sense. So we've seen sponsors use the 2000 series or the 5000 series for their promotional materials. So likely whatever will help you keep organized um, and keep from interfering with other, your other submission types. Okay, and we've also been getting some questions just around will uh, the recording and the slides be available? So yes, we will be sending out the slides within the next 48 hours through wraps. So everyone that has attended, you will be receiving the recording um, and these slides. And then looking at some other questions that are coming in. So a question, are bookmarks required for the materials? Um, if, if I understand the question correctly, generally not. So if you think of, uh, if, um, if I'm gonna provide, submit uh, an FD, a website, for example, they just wanna see what that uh, looks like to the end user, whether it's real or a facsimile of it then you don't really need to bookmark that, or it could be a television commercial that's a WAV file. Well, there, there's no reason to bookmark that uh, either, or, or, uh, or other types of submissions like that, material like that. And I sort of chime in and add, so uh, I wouldn't, like Rob said, you don't necessarily need, you don't need the, all those bookmarks uh, they're thinking about. I would focus more on, uh, making sure that what you're submitting is a high resolution or high quality. Uh, so for example, image of a website, make sure that when you zoom in all the way, you can still read that text. Um, I've seen in that happen that images in a high resolution. Um, 
but yeah, I wouldn't worry about those bookmarks in your promotional material. Yeah, and this is why it's always good to do a test pilot, do a few dry runs. One of the very common errors, and it's kind of waned off, is illegible material. People submitting stuff where you you need a, a microscope to read it, then it's very difficult for the reviewer to read it. So if you test, write, dry run, submit these things, you'll get this feedback right away, and you won't have instances like that uh, rejected and returned back to you. Okay. Great. And yes, in regards to the poll earlier, um, Alex, if you could hear us, if that could be those results deployed to um, the attendees and the panelists. Ah, there it is. So Rob and Rachel, would you like to, uh, I know we're just seeing this just now. Um, would you like to speak to just some of the results that you're seeing from, from your guys' end? Well, I would just jump in there. Uh, my gut from looking at this is this is very interesting. So thank you everybody for mm -hmm. answering this. It still looks like there's a, a, a few people who are doing what I call traditional submissions, paper submissions, and some who are not sure that, you know, you probably need to run that to ground because the time's running out. And uh, now's the time to get somebody to help you, whether uh, or whether you do it alone, map out your process and, and get uh, your techniques, your tactics and procedures in place. Don't wait till the day before this uh, becomes mandatory. Yeah, I'm really interested to, uh, from this poll to see the mix of how uh, different folks are doing this. But uh, uh, like Rob said, it's time to uh, move in the EC direction for sure, with the uh, requirement being implemented shortly. Perfect. And then we still got some more more questions trickling in. So it looks like we have another follow up question in regards to annotations. So earlier when we when you said annotations aren't required, do you mean for 2253 subs only? Aren't they required for advisory comments for launch materials under subpart H? Yeah, so we were probably speaking uh, about subpart H. I know on one of my slides I talked about if you have uh, if you subpart H slash E, if you have an accelerated approval of a new drug uh, for a serious or life-threatening illness, for example, yes, you would have uh, want to have the annotated material for that instance. Okay, and then another question regarding group submissions. Uh, so the question is, what if the other products are medical devices and not prescription drugs slash biologics? Um, <laughs> again, that's an all depends question. I'd say if it's a combination product then it's going to one center that has jurisdiction to review it, uh, like CEDAR or CBER, that could potentially be grouped. But if it's something that clearly uh, product A goes to CEDAR and product B goes to CDRH, you likely, you can't group them because CDRH, for example, doesn't uh, use ECTD and uh, this type of submission at this time. Okay. And then you, you may have answered this earlier um, around the electronic or digital signatures, um, but the question came in, does form 2253 need electronic or digital signature? Uh, so that's what we would highly recommend. Um, I think some sponsors have done it with an ink signature um, and included the, the smart version and the uh, ink sign version, but uh, highly recommend getting electronic signatures um, uh, to use on that form in any FDA smart form. And more often than not, I think what we see most people do is they use the functionality of Adobe self sign like Rachel's referring to and just click on that and and digitally sign it that way. Okay. Uh, yeah, we still got a few more questions trickling in. Um, so a question is, would you please describe what is required in a test submission to ECG ESG, my apologies. Uh, 
Um, I can, uh, we can maybe send you some details offline, but uh, if you go back to the, the one slide we have, it, it describes the very high level of the process. There's also a, uh, a, a breadcrumb trail back to where you would go do that. But basically what we would recommend is, is send a sampling, send a test of a different, of a variety of uh, advertising and promotion submissions, not just one for example, 2253 with an, a one accompanying piece of material to go with it, but send an array and uh, try to do different things that mimic uh, real, real world. And my understanding is the FDA is going to, um, in terms of feedback, they're going to be looking at that structure and the way you technically built that submission. So they're not going to be reviewing the content of the, the pieces that you include in that submission, but more giving you feedback on say, if things are in the right section and, and technically correct. Okay, then we actually have a question in regards to some of the, the poll results. So we have um, one of the attendees asking around um, it was the answer of some people using kind of a, a hybrid method where they have ECTD software, but they also, you know, outsource some of those deliverables as part of the submission. Um, could, could you guys speak a little bit about what that process uh, looks like working with, uh, you know, clients where, you know, they utilize, uh, you know, ECD software, but they also will, um, you know, utilize our services team as well for, you know, sometimes if they have some really high profile submissions that they want to assure submission success. Could you talk a little bit about how that process works from your guys' end? Sure, I'll jump in, Rachel, and please add on. Um, usually people think of two things, either A or B. I'm either going to outsource everything or I'm going to either do it all my own in the brick and mortar. Well, that's not the reality of the world we live in today. We live in a hybrid dynamic world. So many, many people they do a lot of things themselves internally and they reach to somebody else to help them, um, a kind of a blended model. So what we do is, uh, and it doesn't necessarily need to be our software. We actually have a lot of people that work uh, in, in other people's software and systems. So we're kind of ambidextrous. We're not, we're, even though we have our own technology and RegOps, we're kind of technology agnostic. We have a big toolkit to do these things. So. If somebody's capacity constrained or they're lacking a, a little bit of expertise, that's where we can come in and, and be a backstop for them. Yeah, I mean, it's really where we can help, right? So if they have a, a very large submission they need help with um, um, or a yeah, certain piece of expertise like Rob mentioned, um, yeah, we can work with them, do a hybrid. Sure. Yep. And, and kind of just one of the benefits with, with Sertar is that we do have both of those flavors with the Global Submit ECDD software, which is cloud hosted and with our Syncrogenic Services team. So it's very easy whenever you do need that help with any type of your submissions um, for, you know, like a Rob or a, a Rachel to, to jump in right away um, to assist and, and get those submissions across the finish line. And then another, another question coming in. Uh, so do you recommend submissions for a drug product? Uh, bu -bu -bu. Let me read this one more time. So do you recommend submissions for a drug product, the next sequence number for ECTD, or start with a high sequence number, example, SN0900? Um, I would say start off with a fresh... Uh number like for example I know Rachel mentioned 2000 or 3000 series if I understand the question correctly that yeah. way uh, that way you'll have it all in numerical order and you can continue on with your other sequences okay great well we are now at the top of the hour. So I do want to thank everyone for attending today's session. Um, and as said earlier, if you enjoyed the, the content of this presentation, we will be back with wraps on May 6 to talk more about regulatory submissions. So you know, once again, thank you all for your time. Um, and we look forward to seeing you May 6th.